Welcome to our service today. Today we are going to talk about hope. We're going to talk about the hope that we have, but we're also going to talk about how we can communicate that hope in the way that we speak and in the way that we live our lives so that um, that hope would be seen or the hope that we have would be seen in and through us. And so as we think about that hope and, and what it means, especially in this time where, where a lot seems uncertain, I wanted to... Uh, open our service with a few verses from Habakkuk chapter 3. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, and though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. And in those verses, you can hear this language of hope come out of Habakkuk as he recognizes that God is sovereign and in control and we can trust him. Uh, even when things seem uncertain and, and maybe like they don't even make sense. So as we as we come into this service to, to hear about this hope and to hear ways in which we can uh, grow in the ways that we communicate this hope, let's go to our God in prayer. Lord, our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you. And Lord, we thank you for the hope that you give us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, help us to, to trust in you. Help us to remember Jesus' promises that, that he says that he will be with us always, even to the end of the age, and the promise that, that he will return and make things right. Lord, help us to have hope that comes from you, even today. Lord, we pray this through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our God greets us this morning. May grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from God, our Father, in Christ Jesus, our Savior, through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
Hey guys, and the story that we're going to tell you is based on John chapter 6 verses 1 to 13 and then we will have an activity for you guys to do after. All right, but we'll start with the story. Everywhere Jesus went, people followed him. Crowds gathered to see him, to hear him teach, and to have him touch or heal them. On this day, the crowd was huge. People just kept coming and coming and coming. There were grandpas, grandpas, moms, dads, big kids, little kids, and tiny babies. There were too many people to count. I wonder if you've ever been in a big crowd of people like that. What was the, that like? Now, maybe it's been a long time since we've been in a crowd like that, you know, like before COVID, where we've been able to be around that many people. But what would, what would it be like? If you can't remember, what, what do you think it would be like to be in that big of a crowd where everyone is crowding in? Everyone was, was so excited to hear Jesus. They all gathered in as close as they could to listen and watch. Then lunchtime came and went, and the people were still listening to Jesus. Supper time came, and they still watched and listened. But at last, the crowd of people around Jesus began to feel a rumbling in their stomachs. Kids asked their parents for food. Babies began to whimper, but there was a problem. Nowhere on that grassy hill was there enough food to feed such a great crowd of hungry people. Jesus asked his disciples, where shall we buy bread for these people? Philip said, I, I know a place near the, here this, that sells bread, but how will we pay for it? It would take a lot of money to buy each person just here just one bite of bread. The disciples were worried and they began to look everywhere for someone who might have some food at least. Finally, Andrew found a small boy who had taken his lunch with him. Andrew asked the boy if he would bring his lunch to Jesus. The boy said that Jesus could have his lunch even though it was very small. Any guesses about what was in the boy's lunch? Hmm. What was in the boy's lunch? There's five little loaves of bread and two fish were in the lunch. The boy had brought a small lunch for one little person. Andrew didn't think this tiny lunch would help, but Jesus took it and said, tell everyone to sit down. Then Jesus opened the boy's lunch and took out the bread and fish. Jesus held up the food and thanked God for it. Then, as the great crowd watched, he began to break the food into pieces, putting it into baskets for his disciples. Without saying the word, the disciples passed the bread and the fish to the grandpas, the grandmas, the moms, the dads, the big kids, the little kids, and even some of the older babies who sat there waiting and watching. Everyone ate and ate and ate. There was so much food that everyone in that great crowd was plenty, and all for the little lunch that was just being big enough for one small boy. I wonder how Jesus could feed so many people from a little lunch. When everyone had finished eating, Jesus said, pick up all the food that is left. Let nothing be wasted. So the disciples took their baskets and gathered every piece of bread that was left over. And can you imagine what they brought back? Twelve baskets full of leftover bread. Jesus had made the one little lunch into much more than enough for one small boy and even much more than the great crowd could eat. Only Jesus could do such a wonderful miracle. Everyone knew that Jesus cared about hungry, each hungry person in the great crowd. All right, so that's the story. And now there's part of that story that we really can't, you know, we can't make five little small loaves feed thousands of people. But there's one part in that story that I want you guys to notice. And that's, is this part of the story where, where Jesus looks out over this crowd of people who are hungry and he has compassion on them. And he asks the disciples, 
where shall we buy bread for these people? You know, how should we feed all of these people? And it's this, this sense of compassion and care for them that Jesus had. And so I want to do an activity with you guys today that, that shows you know, some of that same compassion that, that Jesus had on that crowd of people. And so what we're going to do today um, is I want you guys to, to find some, some paper or, or something and, and to make a card for someone that, that you know um, and that you, that you care about. You know, maybe it's, a, it's for a neighbor or someone who's sick that you want to say to get better. Or maybe, you know, it's someone who, who did something for you and you want to say thank you. Or maybe you just want to tell you know, one of your friends that you're thinking about them and that you can make a card for them. But first, before you do that, let's pray. God, we thank you that, that you love us and you have compassion on us. Um, and help us to show that compassion to other people. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, before you guys go to make your card, we have one more thing to do. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. Bye-bye. See you later. in a country that provides us with immense opportunities, but these opportunities are not shared equally by everyone in Canada. Poverty continues to plague millions of people, especially refugees, racialized Canadians, and Indigenous peoples. And meanwhile, our greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise, fueling climate change and disproportionately impacting those who have contributed the least to the problem. Our faith calls us to respond, but how? At Citizens for Public Justice, we are mobilizing a network of people of faith from across Canada to answer this question together. Our work is rooted in the concept of public justice, which is the political dimension of loving our neighbor, caring for creation, and seeking the common good. This is why CPJ is focused on the role of citizens in political engagement. We bring people of faith together around these shared values. We conduct research and analysis rooted in data and the lived experiences of people. We develop policy recommendations and together we advocate for public justice. CPJ promotes social and environmental justice in Canadian public policy. For decades, CPJ has been a leading voice in the movement to end poverty in Canada. We animate and engage people of faith to achieve climate justice. And we strive to advocate for policies that uphold refugee rights in Canada. Together, we're working for public justice in Canada. Let's show our government that their constituents care about these issues and expect ambitious action. Register your support for CPJ and help us build a more just society. Join us at cpj.ca. Our scripture reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to be reading from verse 12 to the end of the chapter, the end of this letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. 
Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever tried or have you ever had to learn a new language? You know, that includes taking a French class in school or something like that. Have you ever tried or had to try to learn a new language? And if you've had to try, did you manage to become fluent in that language? And that's a different question, right? Learning another language, or learning a language is very different from becoming fluent in that language. Learning a new language often involves learning about about the mechanics of the language. You have to learn grammar and vocabulary and and verb conjugation. You have to learn about word order and idioms and, and certain common ways to communicate ideas. But learning these things, learning the the mechanics of the language, how the language works, as important as it is to learn all those things, it doesn't make you fluent. One of the marks of fluency in a language is that you no longer need to, to think about the mechanics of how the language works about what ending to use on that noun or, or what tense of a verb to use and how a certain idea needs to be communicated in a sentence or you also no longer have to work up the courage to, to use the language. When someone is fluent in a language, they will often note how they can think in that language and they'll even dream in that language. They don't have to translate from their original language or their mother tongue into this new language that they're trying to learn. They, they can read, they can think, they can converse in, and they can use this language that they are fluent in freely. They just get it. And if you're fluent in more than one language, that's something that you've experienced. You get it. You've learned how to speak how to communicate, how to, how to use this new language. And for those of us who are stuck in the learning stages, in learning the, the mechanics of the language stages, fluency is, is just a dream that we hope to attain someday. And so by now, maybe you're wondering, what does all this stuff about the mechanics and, and of language and the fluency in a language, what does this have to do with Paul's letter to the Thessalonians? You see, as Paul writes to the Thessalonians, he is trying to teach them, and according to verse 27, all Christians across time and, and us today, he's trying to teach them a new language. Now, he isn't teaching them a language like Greek or Latin or English, but instead Paul is teaching them and us the language of hope, the language of of hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And so he's teaching us how we should live and and speak and act in, in the hope that we have been given through Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, Paul has been communicating this throughout the whole letter, but here in this final section of his first letter to the Thessalonians, he gets down to some of the mechanics of the language of hope, some of the the grammar that that people and, and we need to learn in order to converse and to use this language well. And so these final things that Paul throws in the letter, these are some of the things that we must learn in order to become fluent communicators of hope. And in these instructions, Paul acknowledges that fluency and hope 
requires us to speak the same language with our mouths and with our lives. Speaking the language of hope with our mouths means that we freely confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that that he has saved us from our sins, that, that he is our savior, and our only comfort is that we are not our own, but that we belong body and soul in life and in death to him. Speaking the language of hope with our lives, however, means that that we live lives that say the very same thing. That we live lives that communicate what we say with our mouths just in a different way. And to grow toward this fluency in the language of hope, we have to recognize that this is not something that happens overnight. It's also not something that we can accomplish on our own. The Holy Spirit, Paul teaches us, leads us toward fluency. And in this list of instructions that he gives at the end of this letter, Paul highlights three ways in which the Holy Spirit leads us to greater fluency in the language of hope. The first way that the Holy Spirit leads us is through Christian teaching and leadership in the church. The second way is through gospel-shaped community. And the third way is through gospel-shaped living. And so we'll start with the first one. The first way that the Holy Spirit brings us toward fluency and hope is through Christian teaching and leadership in the church. Now, the Thessalonian church was a very young church. And the Apostle Paul actually didn't spend a whole lot of time in Thessalonica planting this church. In fact, he was run out of town by Jews who were angry about his teaching that Jesus is the Messiah. So he may only have been in Thessalonica for for a few months. And so so there were not deeply trained leaders in this church. They didn't have seminary educations. They didn't have much of a history even with the Christian faith. And even so, Paul says to them, acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, who admonish you. Now notice what Paul doesn't do here. He doesn't say, listen to your pastor, obey your elders, do what your deacons tell you to do. He doesn't tell them to remember and respect his authority as an apostle, which he does in other letters and in other places. Now those things would certainly fall within what Paul says, but but what Paul does here is he gives general he gives a general command about acknowledging those who offer Christian teaching and leadership in the church. And he tells them and he tells us to hold them in high regard in love. So what Paul is saying here is, is something more than listen to those in official leadership positions in the church. He's calling on the members of this church to recognize all the ways that the Holy Spirit equips different leaders and teachers among them and to acknowledge that it's the Holy Spirit, it's God who is equipping them. And that's not just the pastor or the elder and the deacons. Leadership comes in many varieties within the church. There are prayer warriors There are mentors, there are wise elders in the church, even if they don't hold an official position. There's administrators, there's teachers, there's evangelists, and and so on. And Paul calls on, on them and he calls on us to recognize these teachers and leaders within the church and to hold them in high regard because through them, the Holy Spirit is, is leading us toward fluency and hope. Now, let me say something about the time that we are living in today. We live in a time and a moment where there is a real mistrust of leadership and authority. And that's true in the church as well. And honestly, much of that is is earned. There are leaders and teachers who have abused power and who have hurt others. And that's terrible and that's wrong and it shouldn't be so. And so we should lament that because it not only harms us as as Christians, but it harms our witness for Jesus Christ. Teachers and leaders in the church are, are to lead with humility and with utter dependence on God because it is God who equips them to, to lead and teach in the church. And as fellow church members, we are called and we have been called to, to hold in high regard 
and to hold in love those who have been called and equipped to do these things. Now, that doesn't mean that leaders should expect full and complete authority and allegiance. That's not how church leadership works. And it also doesn't mean that teachers should expect that no one will ever disagree. No, but, but what Paul is saying is that in the church, we recognize those who work hard among us. We recognize those who care for us and who admonish us. And we, we hold them in, in high regard. We hold these teachers and leaders in, in high regard together no matter what their social standing is, no, no matter what their, what their background and their training is, because we trust that God calls and equips them by the Holy Spirit to help us grow in fluency and hope, that we may live and speak of our hope clearly and well. We hold them in high regard because God is using them to train us and equip us and, and help us to grow in fluency in the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. The second way that the Holy Spirit brings us toward fluency and hope is through gospel-shaped community, which in verses 14 and 15 is characterized by mutual love and accountability. As a community of believers, as a church family, we have a responsibility to one another. We're called to minister to one another, to show love and patience and grace to one another, to call out what needs to be called out, but to do that in love and to encourage all those who need to be encouraged and to help all those who are in need. And this also isn't just supposed to be something that characterizes our community and how we treat one another. It's, a, it's also supposed to be how we treat our community around us as well. And while we exist in an extremely individual society and, and culture and, and world, the church is called to be different. As Christians, we're called to model ourselves after Jesus Christ, our Savior, who humbled himself and gave up everything for our sake and to save us. And so we are called to help each other to live as the people that we are in Christ. And sometimes that means telling each other things that are hard to hear. Paul says to the people in Thessalonica to, to warn those who were idle and disruptive because that was a common issue in the, in the church at that time. But maybe we have to warn someone about their anger issues. Maybe we have to address a long-held grudge. Maybe we have to address an attitude of complacency in the church. And we're called to do that so that we can live into this life and we can live as examples of Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. And there's, there's something about our life together in the church that's for our good and for our growth as Christians. And Paul knows that, that even in Thessalonica not, Thessalonica, not everyone is best friends. Not everyone will always get along and not everyone will always agree on everything. But when we recognize that God uses the church, when we recognize that God uses the church community around us to shape us and to, to help us grow, we can see truly what a gift it is to be a part of the church and love and care for one another in the Lord. And so it's through this gospel-shaped community characterized by, by mutual love for one another and, and, and accountability to the gospel that, that the Holy Spirit causes us to grow toward fluency and hope. And so we should seek to build this kind of a community and to be this kind of a community so that the Spirit can, can lead us together toward fluency and hope. And the final way that, that Paul mentions that the Holy Spirit leads us toward greater fluency and hope is through gospel-shaped living. In verses 16 to 22, Paul tells us what that looks like. He says, rejoice always, pray 
continually give thanks in all circumstances. And he tells us to, to hang on to what is good and of the spirit and to flee from what is not. And so what Paul is telling us is that life will not always be easy and things will not always seem clear cut. But we have reason to rejoice because of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And we have reasons to give thanks because of of this grace in which we now stand. And we have reasons to pray continually for God's kingdom to come, to long for that day when everything will be made right. And we have God's word. We have the Bible, which which helps us discern what is good and of God. And and we need to cling to those things and flee from the things that, that pull us away from God and that are contrary to his word. And these, these basic rules or this basic idea of gospel-shaped living is like that saying that my friend's mom would always say to her when she would go out with her friends. She'd say, remember who you are and whose you are. And that's what Paul is saying to, to the Christians in Thessalonica and to us today. He's saying, remember that you are a child of God saved and redeemed by Jesus promised eternal life through his death on the cross. You are his. And because of this, we can rejoice and we can pray and we can give thanks. We can do all of this because of what God has done. And because we are his, and because he has given us his word and his Holy Spirit within us, we can cling to what is good. We can discern what is good and we can flee from what is not. And as the Holy Spirit leads us to internalize these these basic rules of of gospel-shaped living, we can grow toward fluency and hope, and we can do that together. And now I guess the question to ask about growing in fluency and these three ways that the Holy Spirit uh, helps us to grow toward fluency and hope is, Why is this important? Why should we strive for for greater fluency? And here's why. I took French classes from grades one to 10 in school. And I forget almost everything that I learned. But there are some basic things that, that I do remember like how to order at a restaurant. And so every time I stop at a Tim Hortons in Quebec or in a French-speaking area, I tell myself, order in French. And so I walk up to the counter with every intention that, that I am going to make that order in French. I mean, I, I know how to do it. I know the words that I need to say. But when I get up there, the words come out in English because I'm not fluent. They come out in English because I'm scared to use the language that I don't know well enough. Because I'm not fluent, I'm very tentative in speaking this language. And so the reason why we strive for for greater fluency, the reason why the Holy Spirit leads us into greater fluency that we long for is because as we gain this fluency in hope, we are able to truly live in the joy and freedom of our hope in Jesus. And then we're able to speak the language of hope with confidence and conviction. As we grow toward fluency and hope, we're able to speak the language of hope with confidence and conviction. And that's what the Holy Spirit leads us into through Christian teaching and leaders, through gospel-shaped community and through gospel-shaped living. And as we grow toward fluency, we are better able to understand and better able to communicate this hope that we have in Jesus to others. And not just in the words we say, that's important. But just as important also in the way that we live. And while we may not yet be fluent, 
And while our words and our lives may not communicate our hope perfectly, Paul encourages us to remember that God is faithful. And so as Paul closes this section of his letter, so will we. Paul says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful. And he will do it. Let's pray together. Lord, our God, so often when it comes to this language of hope, we're, we're more concerned with, with what we know and, and how we understand the hope that we have in Jesus. But as Paul shows us here, this language of hope that we need to learn isn't just what we know, but it's also what we say and, and how we live. And so God, by your spirit, guide us into greater fluency. Help us to, to hold in high regard and hold in love those whom you have placed as leaders in our church and, and who serve in those various roles. Lord, help us to, to be a gospel-shaped community and help us to, to strive to, to create that kind of environment where we can help one another grow in fluency and hope, where we can help one another grow into who you call us to be in Jesus. And God, help us to live gospel-shaped lives. Help us to, to trust in you and to live out of who you say we are so that we might communicate well in this language of hope. And we might be able to share that hope with those around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
comes in glory to reveal the fullness of his reign. All hearts will We are sent today to speak the language of hope, to speak it with our mouths in the words that we say, but also to speak it with our lives in the way that we live. And we're sent today also as those who are led by the Spirit to grow in greater fluency in this language that we may speak more and more clearly of the hope that we have in Jesus. And as we are sent to, to speak and communicate this language and to grow in greater fluency, our God blesses us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. And together we say, Amen. <laughs>